activity by uh, 20%. And my second issue was also asked to you uh, by Twitter. Uh, you said that the two-state solution is coming to an end, the possibility of the two-state solution. Could you elaborate on that? Thank you. Um, the two questions are, is, is, uh, is the Iran issue merely a distraction that's being used to, to sort of uh, take attention away from the Israeli-Palestinian issue and the continued expansion of settlements? And then why do I think that maybe the two-state solution is dead, uh, coming to an end? Uh, a couple of things. I don't think it's entirely a distraction. Uh, if I were an Israeli, I, I would worry about uh, Iran as a potential adversary. I would be bothered by the fact that Iran has uh, supported Hezbollah. I would be upset by the fact that Iran has supported groups like Islamic Jihad. Um, so this is not something they're completely conjuring up uh, out of nowhere. Uh, and if I were an Israeli, I'd be worried about Iran getting nuclear weapons. Um, be, for the same reasons that the United States has tended to oppose other countries getting nuclear weapons. We would like to have a lot of them ourselves and have nobody else get them. That would be a perfect world. We haven't had that world, but we've wanted to be as close to that world uh, as possible. Uh, we didn't do very much to stop Israel, but we didn't like it when Israel uh, got nuclear weapons uh, either. Um, so I don't think it's just a distraction. Now, it is, at the same time, a very useful issue to focus everyone's attention because uh, it does divert attention away from other issues that they perhaps don't want the United States or the rest of the international community uh, focusing on. But I don't think it's entirely sort of made up. The question that Israelis and Americans ought to be asking is what's the best way to convince a country not to cross the nuclear threshold? And I have never thought that pointing a gun at another regime is the way to convince them that they don't need some way of defending themselves, some way of, of deterring a possible attack. So continuing to talk about how we're going to come get them and we want to overthrow their government is not exactly the best way to convince them not, uh, not to go across the nuclear threshold. Um, as far as why the two-state solution you know, may, be, uh, may be dead uh, or uh, on life support at best. I think it's, it's sort of uh, two reasons. One is simply the facts on the ground. If one goes to the West Bank and looks where the settlements are and looks where the roads are and the checkpoints and the uh, control of aquifers um, and, and you ask, is it possible now to imagine creating a viable Palestinian state in those lands? It's looking harder and harder uh, with each you know, house that gets built, with each family that, that moves in. And couple that with the fact that Israeli internal politics has been drifting steadily rightward over the last 10 years. The so-called peace camp in Israel is no longer nearly as powerful as it once was. So the combination of far greater changes would have to be uh, agreed to by an Israel in order to make a viable two-state solution. At the same time that Israeli politics is moving in a direction that makes those changes harder and harder uh, to pull off. So again, you can't rule it out because anything human beings can create, human beings can undo. But it's hard for me to imagine that you could really get this to happen anytime soon. And there is a point of no return. I'll just add one other point to that. Where, if I could push yeah. you here. Where I don't know. What, I don't know. I, I've tried to think about this because, again, there's, there's, I can't say anything is impossible. But I do believe there will be a point. And, you know, some people believe we've already passed this point, but there will be a point where it's going to be obvious to everybody that the Oslo process really failed, that two states for two peoples is simply not going to happen. I don't, I'm not saying we're past that point, but we're, I think if we continue with the direction we're going, we will get there. And then there's going to be a moment where, uh, you know, an, an American Secretary of State or spokesman or President will get asked the question, Mr. President, what do you favor now? What is your policy with respect to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict? And if he says, or she says, uh, we favor a two-state solution, everyone in the room will just laugh. No one will take it seriously. It will be seen as completely unrealistic, someone at odds with, uh, with reality. And if we get to the point that an American leader cannot defend the two-state solution, then the next question is, well, if you can't have a two-state solution, what do you favor? One state democracy? That sounds an awful lot like America, right? No group having advantages, no group favored, one person, one vote, regardless of race, religion, creed. That sounds a lot like America. What are your alternatives to one state democracy, Mr. President? 
Permanent apartheid? That doesn't sound very much like America. Ethnic cleansing? That doesn't sound like something we're supposed to be in favor of anymore. So it's a very awkward moment for that American leader at the point at which a two-state solution is no longer seen as even remotely possible. And I would, you know, if I had five minutes with President Obama, which I'm unlikely ever to get, but uh, I would be telling you, if you want you or your successor not to face that question, you ought to get serious about it while there is still some time left. Okay. Gentleman right here has been waiting patiently. Yeah. Go ahead, sir. Uh, what is your view about sanctions? Are they wise, and are they likely to be successful? Thank you. Um, <coughs> Well, I, I guess, I pre like everyone else, I prefer sanctions to war. Like almost everyone else, I prefer sanctions to war. But I just remind everybody, we've been sanctioning Iran now for 20 plus years, in fact, by some measures, ever since the Iranian Revolution. And the result has been the exact opposite of what we claim to want to get. All right, what we were trying to get was an end to Iran's nuclear enrichment program. And as I said in my talk, in 2000, Iran wasn't enriching anything. And by 2008, they had 4,000 centrifuges running, even though we'd started sanctioning them back in the 90s, and we were continuing to ramp up the sanctions, and we've continued to do so as well. So if this is the policy that will ultimately bring Iran to its knees, it hasn't worked yet. We, they are much closer to whatever that nuclear threshold is than they were when we started putting the squeeze on them. Second, the sanctions obviously impose a considerable amount of suffering on, on the Iranian people, which can't be good for our overall uh, relationship with them. And they are contrary to our efforts to convey to Iran that we would like to have a better relationship. Now, it's possible, I don't know this, it's possible that this, the sanctions are squeezing them to some degree and that this is one of the things that's encouraged Iran now to come to the bargaining table and be willing to talk to us. At which point we have to decide if we're willing to take some form of yes for an answer. I think there is no evidence to suggest that Iran will ever agree to suspend all nuclear enrichment. This is a matter of national pride. It's a very important issue, and it's across the political spectrum. The leaders of the Green Movement, the opposition movement in Iran, were among the founders of Iran's nuclear program. So even if you got regime change in Iran, a new Iranian government would almost certainly want to have an enrichment capacity as well. So we're going to have to find some deal where we back off a little bit from what we've been insisting, and hopefully we get reciprocal concessions from Iran that satisfy our concerns and persuade them that, again, staying on this side of the nuclear threshold makes more strategic sense for them as well. Um, I just want to take one more question from Twitter, and then we'll take one more from, uh, from the room. Um, a user asks, um, do you think that an airstrike almost guarantees a ground war to follow? Uh, no. Uh, I, I believe that the uh, United States, if it doesn't learn quickly, it has learned a few things in the last decade. And I think we have learned that uh, sending large amounts of U.S. forces into countries where they're not welcome uh, is not a very good idea. Uh, I would also remind everybody that Iran's population is substantially larger than that of Iraq. Iraq you know, is, what, roughly 30 million or so, and I think Iran is around 70 or 80 million. Or so. so this is a substantially larger country and a substantially more populous country. Uh, Se former Secretary of Defense Robert Gates was right, right? If you think Iraq was, uh, was hard work, trying to uh, occupy or conquer Iran uh, is a really a fool's errand. And therefore, even if, contrary to everything I think makes sense, the United States decided uh, to use uh, military force in the form of airstrikes against Iran, I can't imagine any circumstances where we would send substantial numbers of American troops there. I'm just going to take a final question from the gentleman who's waiting in the corner there. He's been waiting patiently. Just one second, the microphone will be there. Um, okay, so I guess uh, one question was, um, uh, one question was, at, you know, with oil at $100 a barrel or so, uh, you know, there's a lot of coal in the United States, a lot of uh, oil sands in Canada and Venezuela. How does that change? I mean, and I believe that like like the Fisher Trope process to um, convert to coal to oil or is uh, profitable at below like sixty or seventy dollars a barrel. So I was wondering if how that changes the strategic position a little bit. And then 
one, one more quick question is, um, have you uh, heard any of what uh, William Benny's interview, uh, who is a former uh, technical, <coughs> excuse me, technical director at the NSA, um, uh, he had an interview on Democracy Now about, uh, I mean, one thing, I mean, he, he resigned from the NSA and he was, uh, I mean, his opinion at this point was that uh, the government has everyone's emails and that kind of thing. And um, I mean, and he's a technical director at the NSA, so I mean, at least it's worth listening to, right? And uh, and they're you know they're building a large data center out in Utah, right? The NSA is building. It. That's true. Um, and then, can you conclude is, is the question? So, question? Sorry, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay. So I guess my question is like, uh, what do you think about how that influences? Like, I mean, you're saying, like, y y you don't like. I, I guess there was one post. <coughs> Post. <coughs> why don't we try? Why don't we try to get a response to your yeah, first yeah, question uh, uh, in relation to uh, you know the price of the price of natural resources in the yeah. world? Yeah. Uh, the, uh, on the on the first issue, uh, I mean, to what extent does the possibility of alternative energy sources uh, change some of this? I mean, if in fact the United States has access to other sources of energy at at market prices, then you could imagine a world where the Persian Gulf matters less. Um, and we don't worry about it in general uh, as much. I think we're some distance away from that sort of a world, and this is not my field. I am not an expert on, on energy uh, sources or not, but I would just add that it is not necessarily a good thing if we have uh, more abundant and cheaper sources of fossil fuels, because while we busily drive more SUVs because we can now afford the gas, uh, we uh, increasingly uh, alter the Earth's climate. Uh, I recommend, if you want to be really scared, read James Hansen's op-ed in today's New York Times about how you know using coal sands from Canada might solve our problems with the Persian Gulf, but cause all sorts of other problems with the, with the environment. So I think we have to be thinking much more broadly about energy issues. Um, on the the question of the NSA, which never quite got asked, I'll just say the following thing: is that that. Um, we ought to recognize there is a broader set of problems created by sort of having these constant war scares. Um, and that is that it's, I think, a mechanism by which the American people are constantly being told that there are great and looming dangers out there and that horrible things are likely to happen. And therefore, you should not uh, complain if people want to read your emails, if uh, we want to send drones into any country we feel like it, if we want to prosecute whistleblowers very aggressively. This is something, by the way, that the Obama administration has done with great enthusiasm. Um, and it's all part of a world in which we, again, with thousands of nuclear weapons, more defense spending than the next 20 countries put together, protected by two enormous oceans and with a highly advanced and robust economy relative to many others, we somehow managed to get ourselves scared <laughs> by what are ultimately very small problems. And I think that mostly has to do with the way in which politics is done here in the United States and much less about what's very really going on in the world today. And that's one of the reasons that you have data centers in the NSA and things like that out there too. Professor Walt, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you all for, for coming.